March 8th is International Women's Day. Today I want to talk about a remarkable young woman, Malala Yousafzai. You've probably heard of her. Malala is the daughter of a man who ran a chain of schools in northwest Pakistan in an area called the Swat Valley, which is not far from Afghanistan. Some of those schools were schools for girls, and Malala was a student at one of those schools. When the Taliban began moving into that area of the Swat Valley, they limited the, the access to the girls' schools and then eventually started destroying the schools. During that period, Malala and her friends were outspoken critics of the Taliban. They spoke to numerous media outlets, including the New York Times and the BBC. Their message was always straightforward. Education is a right of every child, and girls have as much right to education as boys do. Now, all this media attention also attracted the attention of the Taliban, and fairly soon her family and Malala began receiving threats. But Malala and her friends would not be dissuaded. They continued to, speaking, to speak truth to power. Now, one day Malala was riding the bus with her friends, and a Taliban gunman came onto the bus, and he said, Which one of you is Malala? Speak up or I'll shoot all of you. Well, she did speak up, and he shot her in the head and wounded two of her friends in the process. Miraculously, Malala survived. She was airlifted to a hospital in England where she was in a coma for a while, and then after a month's long stay, was released. The Pakistani Taliban took credit for the attack, calling Malala an example of an infidel and an obscenity. Malala, though, is a kind of an unstoppable force, and in 2014, she won a Nobel Peace Prize, and she currently runs a foundation supporting education and women's rights. I want to show you two clips that I think demonstrate Malala's particular kind of courage. The first one is a clip from her, her appearance on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and the second one is a short clip from her Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. I hope you enjoy them. We could not just stand by and see those injustices of the terrorists denying our rights, ruthlessly killing people, and misusing the name of Islam. We decided to raise our voice and tell them, have you not learned have you not learned that in the Holy Quran, Allah says, if you kill one person, it is as if you kill the whole humanity. Do you not know that Muhammad, peace be upon him, the prophet of mercy, he says, do not harm yourself or others. And do you not know that the very first word of the Holy Quran is the word Iqra, which means read. The terrorists tried to stop us and attacked me and my friends who are here today on our school bus in 2012. But neither their ideas nor their bullets could win. We survived. And since that day, our voices have grown louder and louder. The way Malala lives her courage is remarkable to me for three reasons. First, she resists violence despite the fact that terrible violence has been done to her. Second, she sees herself as part of a movement rather than just one person acting on her own. You saw how she called her, she pointed out her friends during her acceptance speech. The lack of ego to me is a kind of courage, the courage to be part of a group. And finally, she does not reject Islam, despite the way that Islam was twisted to be used against her. Again, courageously sticking with the religion that she believes in. My question, though, is how does, how does courage inspire more courage? When Malala was shot, I was in Afghanistan. I'd been in Afghanistan for three months. My job there was repairing the x-ray scanners at the gates of all the little bases that they used to check vehicles and people for bombs. 
While I was there, right around that time, I joined a small congregation of Unitarian Universalists that was led by an army chaplain named Chris Antal. On Veterans Day in 2012, Chaplain Antal gave a sermon called A Veterans Day Confession for America. In this sermon, he pointed out how America, both as a government and a society, celebrates war but neglects its veterans. Now, everybody, that, everybody in the room who was listening to this sermon was either active duty military, most of them holding guns during the sermon, or veterans like myself. And everyone there saw the truth of this sermon because they were living it. Unfortunately, the higher-ups of, of Chris Antal did not see it that way, and they began to work to remove him from his job and send him home from the war. So, when, when I looked at the bravery that Chris and Molala showed in their determination to speak to, to, truth to power, it was nothing for me to be one of the first people to write a letter of protest and support for Chris to his command. Now, I too could have been sent home if my employer had heard about this and took this the wrong way, but when I saw the shining bravery all around me, I knew I had to do that. Eventually, Chris's higher-ups did send him home, and before he left, he asked me to be lay leader of our little fledgling fellowship. And I had all of these good reasons why I shouldn't do it. <laughs> I was not good enough. I didn't know what I was doing. I was not a virtuous enough person, that's for sure. You know, couldn't somebody else do it? But the truth of the matter was I was afraid. I was afraid to take responsibility for this place that had become sacred and so important for the people who were involved. Our little fellowship had become an oasis in the middle of a very, very hard place. And it scared me to be the one who had to hold it together. But when I looked at the example of Malala and the, and the example of Chaplain Antal, I knew that I had to do it. Courage does beget courage. May we watch for the acts of courage that are all around us. And may we draw on that bravery when we need to be brave ourselves. Amen and blessed be.